Hello. The purpose of the videos that I've made and posted are to make up the class on Tuesday, March the 3rd, that was canceled. In this video, I'll pick up where we left off in the previous class. Now, with respect to benzene and its structure, it was difficult for chemists to figure out. It was discovered in the early 1800s. In 1965, Auguste Kekulé proposed a structure which was a better idea than anybody, anybody else had. He, his structure is shown here. And indeed, it solved a number of uh, problems with respect to benzene and explained a number of properties. The structure basically is a six carbon ring with three separate double bonds. We would assign to it the name 135-cyclohexatriene. His structure did explain a number of properties that are observed for benzene. For example, accounts for the observed number of isomers that you see when benzene undergoes substitution reactions. But in other respects, it had huge problems. Now, if Kekulé's structure were correct, uh, number one, benzene should undergo addition reactions, but it does not. If the structure were correct geometrically, benzene would show two different CC bond lengths, a short one for the double bond and a long one for the CC single bond. However, when we look at benzene observationally using high-tech instrumentation, we find that all carbon-carbon bond links in benzene are the same, namely equal to 1.4 angstroms. If his structure were correct, benzene would show only a modest stability at best. In actuality, benzene has a huge stability. Now, one thing we do have to acknowledge is that Kekulé's structure is partly correct. It's known that benzene is a planar six carbon ring. That part, we could say, he got right. Well, what is the correct structure of benzene? In view of the testing and the observations and the work of Huckel applying molecular orbital theory, the correct observed structure of benzene is shown here. It's a planar six carbon ring that doesn't have three separate double bonds, but instead the total of six pi electrons is delocalized over the ring. It's a closed loop of six delocalized pi electrons. And as it turns out, when you examine it with molecular orbital theory, all the major bonding shells are full and all the major antibonding shells are empty. Now, benzene isn't just an exceptional molecule. It's actually one member of a larger family of molecules and ions that we call aromatic. They have certain properties in common. They all have enormous stability. When they react, they do so by substitution reactions, not addition. They are all planar cyclic molecules that have a closed loop of delocalized pi electrons. And there are quite a few members of this important family. However, suppose that we are presented with the structure of a molecule or molecular species how do you determine if it's aromatic or not? Well, um, if you recall, one approach is we uh, do a sophisticated molecular orbital calculation. It will tell us what the molecular orbitals are, what the energies are. And based on that, we can determine if it's uh, aromatic or not. The idea is that 
if you find that all the major shells, all the major bonding shells are full, all the anti-bonding shells are empty, then we can conclude that it is aromatic. Now, if you don't have the sophisticated molecular orbital software, you can do a kind of back of the envelope sketching. We talked about this in class. Uh, it works for a, a, um, a single uh, ring molecule. You draw the molecule so that it's resting on one corner. Regard the molecule as a polygon, draw the polygon resting on one corner. At each atom in the ring, you make a short horizontal line. Draw a point in the center and draw a horizontal dotted line through that. Now the each mark that you draw is an energy level. So it's the represents the the energy of a mol molecular orbital. If the molecular orbital levels lie below the dotted line, they're regarded as bonding. If they lie above, they're considered non-bond, uh, I'm sorry, anti-bonding. If they happen to lie on the dotted line through the center, if, if electrons occupied them, they would neither help nor hurt bonding. They're called non-bonding molecular orbitals. Well, the next step is to count the total number of pi electrons. And in your structure, uh, we can see, well, it, the example we're doing here is cyclobutadiene. We did this in class before, I believe. It's got two double bonds. Each double bond is two pi electrons, so there's a total of four. So we take the four electrons, we pour them into the available uh, energy levels, uh, molecular orbital energy levels, just like an atomic uh, level atomic orbital, it can have, it can be empty, have one or two electrons. So our molec our lowest energy molecular orbital, we place two electrons in it and it's full. The, uh, the next uh, MO energy levels are here and here. Um, we place one electron in one and one in the other. That's applying Hund's rule. Now we're done. We stand back and, and we see that we have a problem. We have the second major major energy shell along the, the non-bonding level is incompletely filled. That's that's bad. That would add instability to the molecule. This molecule, therefore, is not aromatic. Um, let's work this example. We might have done this in class. I can't remember, but uh, this is a cyclopentadienyl uh, anion. We draw the pentagon, as it were, resting on one corner, draw the marks in. We have to count pi electrons. And here we go, the double bond, there's a pair here, that's two, three, four. Now the lone pair, should we count that as a pair of pi electrons? Well, actually, uh, it's correct if we do. We'll have more to say about that shortly, but we're going to count this pair of this lone pair as a pair of pi electrons, and so the total is six: one, two, three, four, five, six. We pour the six electrons into the available energy levels: two in the lowest, two uh, on, in this uh, in this level, two in this remaining level. These uh, two levels are degenerate and comprise a a major energy shell. Notice you look closely, the energy of that major shell is below the dotted line that makes them bonding orbitals. Stand back and look at this. We have the situation where all the major bonding shells here and here are full. There are two in the lowest major shell, the total of four in the next high, higher major shell. And that's a good circumstance. A very stable molecule, all the bonding shells full, all the anti-bonding ones here completely empty. Therefore, we conclude that this molecule, or rather molecular ion, is aromatic. Now, one issue that I want to explain is 
how do we know that this lone pair is a pair of pi electrons? That's what I want to now uh, discuss. In this slide, I, I address the issue in this way. Look at these three different molecular structures. They're a positive ion, an anion, and then a neutral molecule. We ask the question, can I draw resonance structures for these? You might want to think about that for a little while before I answer. The key is to go back to the original resonance patterns that I introduced in chapter two last semester. I think I've posted uh, that page in our notes, previous notes, because it did come up, I believe. But uh, my apologies for students uh, in the first semester that uh, didn't hear my story on that. Um, the way we draw resonance structures is to realize that uh, they follow resonance structure patterns. There's, well, technically a total of four. Um, let's go ahead and uh, see if we can draw resonance structures for these using those patterns. We look at the first. This complies with resonance pattern one. Indeed, we can draw a resonance structure. We do that on the next slide here. We move the bonding pair one, one bond, and we get our second resonance structure. For th this uh, anion, this conforms to pattern number two. And what we do is we shift two pairs, the lone pair, one bond, the shared pair over on the atom. And that's done in this slide here. And that gives us a second resonance structure. The th third uh, molecule, this, uh, if you look at it, conforms to pattern number two. We have a lone pair in one atom uh, next to a double bond. Just like up here, we shift the lone pair one bond, shift the shared pair over onto the atom, and we get the second resonance structure. Now, the whole idea is this. The the fact that we can draw resonance structures for those species means that we can shift pi electrons. Now, the only way that we can really shift pi electrons is if they belong to a set of consecutive parallel overlapping p orbitals. Together, they would comprise what we call a conjugated pi electron system. All of these represent conjugated pi electron systems. And although they're not, they're not drawn uh, in these structures here, um, there are there is a p orbital in each of those atoms. And in fact, they're all drawn in right here. Um, p orbital on, on each of these atoms for the first structure, each of the atoms on the second one. The p orbitals are uh, in each case consecutive, parallel, and overlapping here, here, and also here. So, uh, in general, um, we can look at it as follows. When, when you're trying to examine a structure to determine if, if uh, what, what are pi electrons and what are not, when you have a structure that has a lone pair next to a pi bond, that lone pair can be regarded as lying in a p orbital that in fact is parallel to the neighboring p orbitals. And we'll count that pair of electrons as a pi electron pair. That's, that's what we did over in this structure here. General rule, when we have a lone pair on, a, on, on an atom next to a double bond, we can assume that that lone pair belongs in a p orbital and that p orbital is parallel to the neighboring p orbitals. This p orbital, realize, is perpendicular to the ring. All right. Another generalization we can make if we have a structure and we see a plus charge next to a pi bond, that plus charge lies in a p orbital that, that is parallel, in fact, to the neighboring p orbitals. Now, remembering this is going to help us uh, uh, decide whether a molecule is uh, aromatic or not. All right. Now, in addition to using the Frost circle method, 
there's there's another method that we can use to determine if a given molecular species is aromatic or not. All aromatic species obey four criteria. And so it's just a matter of this, seeing if a molecule in question obeys each of the four criteria. The four criteria are as follows. The species has to be cyclic. It has to be planar. Third, it has to have conjugated pi electrons completely around the ring. That means a p orbital at each ring atom perpendicular to the ring. It ha there has to be a closed loop of pi electrons completely around the ring. The fourth criterion is the total number of pi electrons um, has to be a, a kind of a permissible number, an acceptable number. And by that I mean as follows. The total number of pi electrons has to f conform to a mathematical formula, the formula being 4n plus 2. The total number equals 4n plus 2 with the parameter n being a whole number, either 0, 1, 2, or 3. Well, let's explain with an example. We know benzene uh, is aromatic. Let's, let's see if it obeys the four criteria. Here is a, uh, a structure of benzene. Of course, we're using the Kekulé structure. Um, it's obviously cyclic. It is planar. There's a p orbital at every atom perpendicular to the ring. So criterion three is, uh, is met. The total number of pi electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six. That number six. All right, we set that number six to the formula for n plus two and we solve for n. Now, if n comes out, 0, 1, 2, or 3, then, aha, uh -huh, we've got an aromatic species. Well, setting 6 equal 4 and plus 2, solving for n, n equals 1. Indeed, n, n um, is, is a whole number, and therefore, benzene does comply with criterion number 4. All four criteria uh, are complied with, and therefore, benzene, of course, is aromatic. Oh, there's another term that we use. If the total number of pi electrons for criterion four um, satisfies that four n plus two formula and equal being a whole number, we say that 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 total number is a hukal number of pi electrons. A hukal number of pi electrons. And a species that has a uh, total number of pi electrons equal to that, we can say the species has a hukal number of pi electrons. Let's look at some other examples. Um, now this one, this cyclopentadienyl anion, we, we uh, use the frost circle method to analyze. Now let's just examine the four criteria. Number one, it's cyclic, put an okay there. Two, yeah, it's planar. I think you can see that. Uh, one policy I, I, I uh, have with respect to questions like this, if, if, the, uh, if the molecule is small enough and I can, and, 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 it, and it looks like you can tell just by looking at if it's plain or not, then, then just decide. On the other hand, if a molecule is too large and it's not easy to tell, I will straight away tell you if it's plain or not. Anyway, this is, um, um, it is planar. Number three, uh, we've already, um, well, that lone pair again. The rule is that if the lone pair is adjacent to a double bond, you can assume that, that it's in a p orbital and that p orbital is parallel with the p orbitals of the double bond um, and that being the case, you can see that there is a p orbital every atom perpendicular to the ring. We do have a closed loop of pi electrons all around the ring. And so we put an OK for number three. The total number of pi electrons, of course, the lone pair lying in a, in a parallel p orbital. It is a pair of pi electrons. We'll count that. We'll count one, two, three, four, five, six. Six indeed is a hukal number of pi electrons. Uh, with respect to the formula, n of the formula is, was, is equal to one. The next example is a five-membered ring, two double bonds of positive charge. Um, that cyclopentadienyl cation. Is it aromatic? Well, let's go through the list of four and see. Number one, it's certainly cyclic. Yeah, yeah it's planar. Three, uh, three is okay. Remember what we uh, indicated before, kind of a uh, general principle. 
when you have a structure that has a positive charge next to a pi bond, then you can assume that that uh, positively charged atom has a p orbital there that's parallel with a neighboring p orbital. So indeed, we can uh, uh, assign a p orbital here that's going to be parallel with the neighboring p, p orbitals, perpendicular to the ring as well. If you look, you would indeed have conjugated uh, pi electrons all the way around the ring, a closed loop of pi electrons, so criterion 3 is satisfied. We put an OK there. Total number of pi electrons is 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, let's see if it's a Huckel number or not. So we set the total 4 equal to 4n plus 2. We algebraically solve for n. We get, oops, not a whole number. It's 1 half. Therefore, the number 4 is not a permissible number. It's not a Huckel number. Uh, this molecule, it obeys three of the criteria, but not the fourth. Therefore, it's not aromatic. Now, let's look at this uh, species. This is a neutral molecule. Uh, it is known. It actually exists. It's, it's uh, cyclopentatriene. One, three, five, cyclopenta... I'm sorry, did I say? It's a cyclo... Uh, cyclo... Um, hepta Heptatrine now, okay, <laughs> I'm getting it kind of messed up here. It would be 135 cycloheptatrine, seven carbons. All right, now let's look at the, at the criteria. Uh, number one, uh, it's cyclic. Uh, yeah, it's planar. If you had time to make a model, you see it, that it's planar. Um, number three, Hmm, well, there's p orbital here, 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 and here, uh, uh, perpendicular to the ring. But, oops, that's a, actually a methylene CH2. And there's no p orbital, obviously. It's, it's, it's blocked at this point. It's not a closed loop of pi electrons. Criterion 3 is not satisfied. And uh, we don't have to go any further. It's not aromatic. The next molecule actually is also a, a uh, seven-membered ring. It's similar to this, but it has a positive charge in this atom instead of a CH2. Well, let's go through the criterion. Number one's okay, cyclic. Two, it's certainly planar. Three, well, now this time, as before, when you have a plus charge um, adjacent to a double bond, one can assume that there's a p orbital hole uh, where that positive charge is parallel with the p orbitals of the dull bond. Indeed, this, we got p orbital perpendicular to the ring. The, re, the remaining atoms of the ring have a p orbital, so it, there is uh, conjugated uh, pi electrons completely around the ring, a closed loop of pi electrons. Criterion three is satisfied. What about the fourth? The, the, is there a permissible number of pi electrons? What's the total number? Well, we count one, two, three, four, five, six. Six indeed is a Huckel number uh, when you when you set it equal to four plus two n equals one. So it is aromatic overall. Now look at this example. Um, this is a cyclic species. It's got cis and trans double bonds in it. Hmm, is it aromatic? Well, let's go through the criterion. Um, number one is cyclic. Obviously, that's okay. Two planar. Well, hmm. Let me come back to that. Number three, there's p orbitals each of the atoms of the ring perpendicular, so that would be okay. Um, the number of pi electrons happens to be equal to 10. Um, well, let's look at that um, later. Let's go back actually to number two. I, uh, I shouldn't have really gone on because... Um, well, the question, I, I just didn't answer it. If you had the time to make the model, well, you'd see something. That's shown down here. I'm, notice I'm omitting the hydrogens. If you put them in, it turns out that they try to occupy the same point in space. Two things can't occupy the same point in space. What happens is two hydrogens will repel each other, and that causes the molecule to twist out of planarity. It is not a planar molecule. If it's not planar, shows over, it can't be aromatic. Um, now, however, let's make, uh, um, 
a revision in our structure. Let's take away these two hydrogens and directly bond these two carbons with a single bond. That's what we have here. Now, let this, this, let's look at this. With the number one, it's cyclic. It's also planar. Number three, there's a p orbital uh, at each atom of the ring perpendicular. Uh, therefore, it's a conjugated pi electrons completely around the ring. It'd be a closed loop uh, completely around the ring. You can see that looking at the periphery of the ring all the way around it. So criterion three is okay. The total number of pi electrons, when you count them, it's, there's one, two, three, four, five double bonds, two, two pi electrons for each double bond. That's two times five is 10. Um, 10, oh goodness, I don't have it uh, worked out here, but if you set 10 equal to the formula 4n plus 2 and you solve for n, I think you all can do the algebra, n comes out to 2, and, and that's, that's an okay number, it's got to be a whole number. So, so the number 10, having a total of 10 pi electrons, that 10 is a Huckel number, so criterion 4 is okay. All four criteria are obeyed, therefore this compound is aromatic. This is a known compound, it's called naphthalene, and it's uh, commercially used as a moth repellent. Now the next example is, uh, is, um, is very interesting, and it, uh, it, it breaks stride with what we've done before. All the other examples are strictly hydrocarbon, well, hydrocarbon species. This one has is a called a heterocyclic compound. It contains an element other than carbon in the ring. The particular compound, it's known, it's called furan. Let's go through the criteria to see if it's aromatic or not. Number one, it's cyclic. Hope you can see, yeah, it's a small enough ring. You can tell that it's, it is planar. Number two is okay. Now, just trying to decide on the criterion three and then four, we, this is a little bit of thinking through that we have to do. You see in the structure, there's two lone pairs on the oxygen. Well, remember our rule. If we have a lone pair adjacent to a pi bond, you can assume that lone pair is in a p orbital and that that's parallel to the other p orbitals. And in fact, if the molecule does that, it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give it uh, greater stability. Molecules will assume that arrangement, which gives them, which makes them more stable. So I've drawn it over here. I've drawn uh, one of the lone pairs, in fact, in a p orbital. It's perpendicular to the ring, parallel with the neighbors. Now you might ask, well, what about that second lone pair? Well, it's still there, but it's not in a p orbital. It turns out to occupy a hybrid orbital, actually be an sp2 hybrid orbital that's in the plane of the ring. All right, now, so um, indeed, one of the lone pairs uh, will be in a p orbital that's, that's uh, perpendicular to the ring. Criterion three uh, has uh, uh, a p orbital at each atom perpendicular, perpendicular to the ring. You would have delocalization of the pi electrons all the way around the ring, a closed loop of pi electrons, and so criterion three is okay. Now what about number four? We count pi electrons. What's the total number of pi electrons? Well, we're not gonna count the lone electron pair that's in a hybrid orbital. We will count this lone pair of electrons uh, as being a pi, pair of pi electrons. It lies in a p orbital parallel with neighbors. And the total number of pi electrons would be one, two, three, four, five, six. And you remember, six indeed is a, is a hookal number of electrons. So criterion four is met. All four, all four criteria are obeyed. Therefore, this compound is aromatic. Furan, as it's called, is aromatic. issue is how do you name substituted benzenes? That's what I now want to talk about in this uh, video. Well, all the possible substituents that we find on benzene, they fall into two categories, low class or high class. 
um, low class, low, low priority, high class, high priority. Here are some examples of so-called low class substituents, a halogen, chlorine, bromine, iodine. The NO2 group, that's the nitro group. An alkyl group, ethyl, methyl, propyl, is a low class substituent except for methyl, and that actually is a high high class substituent. Here's another so-called low class, it's called uh, a nitril substituent, or also a cyano substituent. Examples of high class substituents include hydroxyl OH, amino NH2, the methyl, aldehyde group, carboxyl group. This is called a sulfonic acid group, and this is a ketone group. All right, let's first look at benzene that has one substituent, so-called monosubstituted benzene. How, how do you name a monosubstituted benzene? We look first at the substituent, determine if it's a low class or high class. If it's a low class substituent, you basically, uh, its name will have benzene at the lighter part of the name. The first part of the name will be a prefix that refers to the substituent. So, for example, if we have benzene with a, with a chlorine attached, we assign the uh, name for the chlorine substituent, which would be a chloro. Chloro appearing as a prefix, and then the word benzene, the name is chlorobenzene, all one word. A benzene with a nitro group, the, the uh, substituent, it has the name nitro. It's uh, written as a prefix. And we say nitrobenzene, all one word. Nitrobenzene is the name for this ben for this substituted benzene. Here we have benzene with an ethyl group. The name of the substituent is ethyl, so the name of the compound is ethyl benzene. Now, suppose a, you have a monosubstituted benzene with a so-called high-class substituent. They're listed up here. In that case, you know the name benzene no longer appears at the end of the name. We assign a spatial unit name in each of those instances, and I want to uh, show you what they are down here. The, with a hydroxyl uh, substituent, high class, uh, one doesn't say hy hydroxybenzene. Uh, uh, instead, you assign the name phenol. The NH2 amino group, you don't say aminobenzene. Instead, you say aniline. Methyl and benzene, you don't say methyl benzene, actually, you use the single unit name toluene. The aldehyde group here in benzene, this is called benzaldehyde. This compound, uh, car carboxyl group on the benzene, you say benzoic acid. On this, with the SO3H group on the benzene ring, the name we assign to that is benzene sulfonic acid. The SO3H group is a uh, acid group. It's moderately strong acid. This uh, ketone type group here, um, you don't say uh, a, a so and so benzene, you say acetophenone. That's the unit name you apply to that acetophenone. All right. Now, in the case of disubstituted benzene, the question is, are the, sub, uh, the substituents low class or uh, is one of them high class? That's the situation we're going to look at. First, we'll look at a case of where both substituents are low class. As in the next example here, we have a benzene with a chlorine and a nitro group attached. Now, there's two ways to, to name them. You can name them by numbering the uh, atoms of the ring or this. You might recall that uh, disubstituted benzenes, there's three possibilities, and um, they're, they're ass assigned as follows. The, the benzene with two substituent is called an ortho disubstituted benzene. That is when the two substituents are on adjacent atoms. When they're in the one three position, that's called the uh, meta disubstituted benzene. 
when the substituents are across the ring from each other in one four position, uh, you use the term para, called the para disubstituted benzene. Now, more often than not, we use abbreviations. So for ortho, we say O hyphen, for meta, we say M hyphen, and for para, we say P hyphen. Um, now, in this example here, um, we note that both substituents, uh, that this would correspond to the meta isomer. And so an appropriate name would be as follows. Well, the two substituents are named in an alphabetical order. Chloro alphabetically comes before nitro. And we put an M prefix, M hyphen, we say M chloro nitrobenzene, all one word. And that's an acceptable name for that uh, disubstituted benzene. Both substituents, low class. Alternatively, we can assign numbers to the uh, locations of the substituents, and we use numbers. The rule we're applying here is really the same that we used in naming uh, substituted uh, cycloalkanes. When you have two substituents, they're named in alphabetical order. The one that alphabetically comes first is said to be attached to carbon one of the ring. So uh, number one uh, is assigned to, the, to that carbon bearing the substituent that alphabetically comes first. Chloro obviously, or chloro uh, comes before nitro uh, alphabetically. So we say that uh, carbon number one is here, then two, then three. And we just use those substituent numbers. And so an alternative name for that compound is one chloro, three nitro benzene, all written as one word. All right, let's look at some other examples. Again, where all substituents are low class. Here, have, here we, in this molecule, we have a bromine and, and an ethyl. Um, they're located uh, in adjacent carbons of the ring that would correspond to the ortho uh, isomer. And so we can use that option in assigning a name. We say O hyphen bromoethylbenzene, named in alphabetical order. If we do it by numbering, bromo comes before ethyl, and so we assign uh, uh, carbon number, we assign number one to the carbon bearing the bromine, and then uh, carbon two would be the carbon bearing the ethyl, and so the alternative name would be one bromo, two ethyl benzene. On this example, it's a dibromobenzene, the bromines are in the para positions, and so we use the prefix. Uh, small case p, we say p dibromobenzene. Using the numbering, uh, then one, uh, one bromine is assigned to carbon one, the next one, the number of the carbons of the ring, be one, two, three, four, the other bromine number four, and so we say one, four dibromobenzene. All right, now let's look at a case of disubstituted benzenes in which one substituent is high class and the other low. All right, in this example here, um, this will be named as a phenol, that's the unit name, bearing a nitro substituent. Well, we note that, that uh, this uh, qualifies as a meta isomer, and so one possibility uh, is to name this Meta nitro phenol, and I have an error here. Change the small p to small m. That should be m nitro phenol. Now, alternatively, you can use numbers, uh, uh, and the idea is this: is that this the higher class substituent, the high class substituent, is assigned to carbon number one of the ring. Carbon number one of the ring is is the carbon bearing the high class substituent. So the OH is high class, nitro is low class, so we, this, this carbon here in the ring is number one. Then we number the carbons around the ring in the direction that assigns the uh, lower possible number to the next encounter substituent. You remember that rule, we go one, two, three. Uh, and so the nitro group is on three, and we uh, say, well, this. Um, 3-nitrophenol, 3-nitrophenol. That is, it's, it's compounded regarded as the nitro group being in the number three position, so you say 
3-nitrophenol. Um, this compound here, this uh, disrupted compound, we've got a methyl here and a um, propyl group. Well, methyl is high class, propyl is low class. So the, uh, this will be named as, as a propyl substituted toluene, right? It's a toluene with a propyl substituent. And we can, it's a disubstituted, so we can use the ortho -meta -para, uh way of naming or by numbering. All right, this uh, you can see is a uh, the para uh, isomer. And so we could assign the name to this para propyl toluene. The propyl group is attached to the position para to the methyl, so para propyl toluene, P propyl toluene. In terms of num numbering, carbon number one would be the carbon bearing the methyl. We number the carbons of the ring to go one, two, three, four. The propyl group is in on number four, and then you, you would th then name it as four propyl toluene. Now, in the case of, of three or more uh, substituents on the benzene ring. Uh, first, you look at the case where all of them are low class. The way you name that is the same. You apply the same rule that you used when we named uh, tri-substituted cycloalkane. Their name, if they're different, they're named in alphabetical order. They're numbered. Now, there's numerous ways to number them, but you choose a set of numbers which, in fact, is the lowest. I won't rehash the, all, all of that, but in this case, the correct numbering would be this carbon, number one, then this one, two, three, and four. And so the correct name the is one, two, four, trichlorobenzene. One, two, four would be the lowest uh, possible set of numbers. Now, an example of a trisubstituted benzene, one substituent is high class. We have the carboxyl group. So the combination of carboxyl and benzene is benzoic acid is the name. Benzoic acid. All right. On the benzoic acid, we have two substituents, the chloro and the bromo. We can no longer uh, say orthometapera because it's trisubstituted, not disubstituted. So we, we're going to do it by numbering. Carbon number one is the carbon bearing the carboxyl group. And we number uh, around the ring to assign the lower possible set of numbers. So we go carbon one, and then to the right, two, three, four. So the, the chloro substituent is on number two, the bromine substituent, bromo is on four. And so the correct IUPAC name for this is two chloro, four bromo, benzoic acid. Okay, there's uh, one remaining issue on nomenclature that I want to discuss. Re recall, um, if you have a alkyl substituted benzene, we use the example of an ethyl group attached to benzene. An alkyl group ordinarily is a low class substituent. So in the case of an ethyl attached to benzene, you would just use the name ethyl benzene. However, uh, there's an exception. If the alkyl group is large or has a complex structure, it's no longer named as an alkyl substituted benzene. Instead, it's named as an alkane with a benzene, or rather we say phenyl substituent. The rule is this, basically if the alkyl substituent has more than six carbons, you name the compound as a phenyl substituted alkane. Look at this example. We have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon alkane. That's a heptane. Instead of naming this compound as a heptane or heptyl substituted benzene, we name it as a phenyl substituted heptane. And we the usual rules apply, the rules that we learned last semester. We count the uh, carbons of the alkane ring, starting from the end near the substituent. We count one, two, three. 
Sui are benzene, or rather called phenyl substituent, is attached at carbon 3. And so we name it as a 3 phenyl heptane. 3 phenyl heptane. Okay, this concludes uh, uh, the video. This is the end of the chapter 18 that I want to cover. So I have another posted video where we begin talking about the reactions of, of benzene. That's in chapter 19. Thank you for your attention.